Gaiman is undeniably one of today's great fantasy writers. My first introduction to his work was through a reading group I was invited to join in middle school. We were told about one of his books that struck some controversy regarding its intended audience. This was a modern and dark tale similar to Alice in Wonderland. You have a young girl named Coraline move to a flat that has a small gateway to another dimension. In this world, her mundane family and neighbors are extraordinary. They're all fantastical versions of themselves with a slight twist. They got buttons sewn to their eyes. This would lead to discovering a dark secret involving murder, dark magic, talking cats, and acrobatic mites. I instantly fell in love with the story. It served as my gateway book to more Neil Gaiman stories such as the Sandman comics and Stardust. After reading the story, I couldn't help but notice something oddly specific about it. Something of which it always felt like it was the springboard for a feature length animated film. Specifically a movie that could combine live action for the real world and stop motion for the other world. For some reason, it could have been my obsession with the movie James and the Giant Peach, but somehow I felt both stories shared similar themes and story elements. It came to no surprise that I wasn't the only one who felt this way. In fact, Neil Gaiman, the author himself, thought the same thing. Gaiman wrote the story in mind for a movie to be made by Henry Selleck, the director of such stop motion classics as The Nightmare Before Christmas, James and the Giant Peach, and Monkey Bone. Selleck got a hold of the story and felt it was worth making some minor changes for the sake of visual storytelling, such as deciding that having the movie completely animated felt more appropriate than making a live action animated hybrid. The result is a movie that at first will make you marvel its bright imagery, get creeped out through some subtle foreshadowing, and eventually scared senseless, Coraline. The basic plot hasn't changed much from the book. A young curious girl is teleported to another dimension through a rabbit hole sized portal where she encounters a talking teleporting cat and an evil dictator bent on killing her. And that's just as many Alice in Wonderland comparisons you can draw for now. Coraline Jones is provided with the voice of the OG of Fanning Girls, Dakota. Of which she's spunkier and not nearly as whiny as her other role from War of the Worlds. I find it's ironic how in a couple of years her younger sister will eventually get casted into a similar role from another movie from the same studio. Either she was casted for a youthful charm, or they owe the Fanning family a favor. Her parents bring her to a flat that constantly reminds you that it's not an appropriate place for children. Surprised she let you move in, my grandma? She owns the Pink Palace. Won't rent to people with kids. In all fairness, the parents seem to have been too oblivious to notice this little detail when signing the lease. She has a family of other neighbors which includes Miss Spiker and Sponge from James and the Giant Peach, and an acrobat with a thick Eastern European accent, mutated blue skin, and a deteriorating psyche. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Was he caught up in the Chernobyl accident or something? Coraline gains a friend through sheer luck of having someone close in age, this was another one of the additions to the story that Selleck included for the sake of plot progression. While this sounds like an annoyance, it's actually not a bad addition. Sometimes a character feels so terribly forced that they don't really connect to the other cast. But because Wybie provides a connection to the owner of the flat, that also connects to Coraline's connection to the other world. In essence, it does improve on the story in ways that works better for a movie than through a book. It also improves on the book because they actually managed to get black people. Don't get me wrong, I ain't no racist, but that original book pales in comparison to the movie. No? Okay. The other world Coraline enters provides her with everything she's neglected from the real world, including a world that manages to sell monkey bone merchandise that doesn't fart on you. I love how despite everything seeming perfect, they don't shy away from the creepiness of getting such specifics down to a T. This makes you question and relate to how a hero feels in this situation. So when the crap hits the fan, the full out shocks feel like a good payoff to great build up. Something of which filmmakers like Damon Lindelof could take note of. Seriously, the guy's built a career of great build up for crappy payoffs. Something I've noticed more times that I've watched this movie is how the other mother provides Coraline with a doll that serves as a personal bug to get a sense of what Coraline wants therefore building upon this fantasy world. 
That part's pretty self-explanatory. But what I've noticed the second time watching this is how all the fantasies are only built after Coraline brings the doll to certain places. So instead of seeing a fantastical version of Mr. Bobinski on the first night arriving into this strange world, she has to experience being with Bobinski first. Subtle hints like that makes this film worth watching multiple times. The voice acting is superb as well. You have Ian McShane as Mr. Bobinski, Terry Hatcher as both Coraline's mother and other mother, and the voice of Gargoyle's Goliath himself, Keith David, playing the talking cat. When I was younger and knew the book had to take place in the UK, I always imagined a more cynical person playing the role. You know, like Simon Cowell. You sounded like Dolly Parton on Helium. It was a bit like ordering a hamburger and only getting the bug. The animation is also a sight worth watching these days. Though the real complaint that I have is sometimes certain scenes aren't animated as fluidly as others. It makes it seem like it just drops the frame rate at certain times. However, I could own this up to the budget, as it still tells the story and feels more like a minor distraction at times. Other than that, the only real complaint I have against this film is the ending. I feel they could have opted out for a simpler ending than what they resorted to. Coraline has to finally put an end to her other mother, who manages to make her way to the world with her severed hand. In the book, she tricks the hand by trapping it in a well. In the movie, it gets made into a stereotypical battle. Not saying it's bad, just a little unnecessary, given that we already had a big action scene earlier. But hey, even if it ain't perfect, the movie manages to have a good, spooky charm. It's loaded with plenty of atmosphere, charm, and a message that tells you if you're a dick to your parents, you will have buttons sewn to your eyes and eaten by a terrifying spider lady. Just like the classic Grim Fairy Tales. Nope, there is no joke there. Those original books, they were messed up. It's fascinating how after The Nightmare Before Christmas, people feel that stop motion horror movies are trying to feed off the success of that film. However, I feel that each movie manages to have its own special unique story that sets itself apart and even improves on Nightmare Before Christmas. I've mentioned before how I felt Corpse Bride is a better movie by comparison. Taking a more mature subject matter like arranged marriage and having a strong theme of acceptance of things going wrong. Coraline feels similar, however, with a different theme. It's a movie made just as much as it is for kids as it is for adults and teenagers. People have even gone so far as to say it's become a new Halloween classic, which makes me agree wholeheartedly enough to give it the worth it rating. For today's question, I would like to know what is your favorite spooky stop motion animated film? It could be this, it could be Paranorman, it could be Frankenweenie, it could be that Eastern European crap they're always coming out with. I don't know. You name it in the comments section below. I'm Joey Tedesco, and thanks for watching this review on the Cartoon Palooza.